The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. A great big musical career, a great big problem. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, how a rock star overcame his addiction. Great Big C was known as Canada's party band, and while they brought the party to Canadians, founding member Sean McCann was struggling. We find out why in his new book, One Good Reason, a memoir of addiction and recovery, music and love. It's co-written with his wife, Andrea Aragon, uh, who also joins us with Sean McCann from just outside of Ottawa in Manatech. Thank you so much for joining us under these conditions. It's nice to meet you. Thanks so much, Nam. Nice it's to lovely to talk to someone who's not our kids. <laughs> <laughs> adult interaction is awesome in this time um you know this book is um uh you really you release a lot of your you reveal a lot of yourselves both of you um i want to get into the book but before i want to go way back um and here is a clip of great big c way back when and i say it's just an ordinary day and it's all your state of mind Sean, when you watch that video, um, what do you think of that time? Um, there were good times in many ways and also, you know, stressful times for me in other ways. I, uh, you know, I was an alcoholic in Canada's favorite party band and I was hiding from a secret. And, um, but you know, it wasn't all bad. When I look back at that, the first thing I had to do was laugh because I remembered that the uh, the rugby teams were actually real rugby teams. <laughs> And they were they in their minds they didn't um, they they thought they were actually playing a real rugby game or they were determined to actually play, and I remember just trying not to get hurt. <laughs> and, uh, How many takes did it take? <laughs> uh, we were good for about four takes. Uh, they just didn't seem to want to stop pounding on each other though. It was an interesting day, and then we all went to the pub, <laughs> which was even more dangerous than the field, in many ways. But I guess that's kind of how my life was then. It was a very uh, in retrospect, a dangerous place, but uh, you know, it was a great place as an alcoholic. I felt like uh, I'd won the lottery to be in that position. That's an interesting statement to make. Um, what do you mean when you say that you you felt like you had won the lottery, like being in a band or being in a situation where it kind of covered up your um, something that you were struggling with? Both, I guess. But being in in, a, in particular, a great big C, the band, the party band from Newfoundland. The kitchen party band. I mean, there was no, uh, there was certainly no social taboo about drinking when it came to our brand of entertainment. Like it was, mm -hmm. it was the same. It was one of the same. It was what you did. Uh, and we were, you know, started on campuses and then moved into hockey rinks and stuff. And it was always a big party, and it always involved a lot of alcohol. So um, just from an alcoholic's perspective, there was no shortage of supply, and certainly no uh, no breaks were ever applied. And the way that you've written this book is um, you have chapters, Sean, you have a chapter, and then Andrea, you have a, chop a chapter. Why did you decide to appro approach the book this way in telling both your stories in one book? Well, it originally started just Sean's book, actually. He had been writing it for about a year, and um, he was showing it to me and, and a friend of ours, Matt, and uh, there was one particular incident in the book that I, I kind of latched onto and I said, hey, I, I have written down in my journal this exact day and I have verbatim what had happened. What, and I what day Sean, was that? Uh, it was the night that he actually stopped drinking, uh, the 11th of November. Is that right? November 11th, 2011. Not, not November 9th. 9th, 2011, sorry. And um, I count every day. Every <laughs> as, day counts. As you should. And uh, I think when Sean read that, it kind of turned his 
instead of being looking inward, he he finally got to see that his true impact on what had happened, happened not just to him, but but to all of us. And he was then determined to have me be a voice. And I was all too happy to, to put my voice to it as somebody who is a family member of somebody going through um, addiction and recovery and everything like that. Yeah, it um, felt I to mean, me, uh, I, when I'd written the book, the first year I wrote the book, and when I when I read it back, it was it was good and everything, but it didn't uh, it didn't really dig deep enough. Uh, I wasn't aware of how much I missed, and of course I wasn't sober, but Andrea was. And uh, even though those sections don't paint me in a particularly positive light, for the most part, they were true. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to tell the truth, which is what we set out to do, then you might as well tell it all. And uh, I just really believe that it became more of a conversation. It almost read like an impact uh, victim impact statement in some ways. And um, which are quite powerful things to read. So we hope that it, um, you know, we went the extra, we went the extra mile literally uh, and dug deeper and it hurt a bit, but uh, I think that what needs to be done in, for real recovery to take place. That's the work that needs to be done. And not to take away from the seriousness of what you just said, because in the book too, you do, you know, like you said that you find, you found out how she was feeling um, because a lot of the times you blacked out and you didn't remember. Um, and the next day you'd wake up and be like, Hey, what's up? And she's like, what's up? <laughs> do you remember what happened last night? Um, there's parts of the book, you know, you both talk about how you met and it was kind of mm -hmm. like, I guess it's like, you just knew that this person was the person for you, but reading um, the book, is there anything else that you found out that you might not have known before from the other person, about the other person? Um, I, I learned a fair bit about uh, Andrea's, where Andrea came from as a person. I had known some of the things about her family, but I didn't know. And she got to speak to it in the book in a very detailed way. And uh, it explains a lot to me. So it was useful. It was helpful to me. I feel like I got to know her a little better, if that's even possible at this point. <laughs> and Andrea, Did you learn anything about, about me? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know that I learned anything new. I learned, like Sean said about me, I learned about his history, his family history, a lot more. I mean, I'd heard about it and we'd kind of gone in circles about it, but I hadn't really seen it in a timeline. And it was fascinating to me how entrenched the Catholic religion is and was in his family. And it was something I had never even considered, actually. Well, you both grew up in homes where things were swept under the rug. Andrea, you actually write that your mom made everything is fine, an art form. <laughs> and the same with you, Sean. Um, like Andrea said, you know, your family had a lot of secrets going back generations. Your father didn't want you to be an altar boy, uh, but never said exactly why. Um, finding out these things about each other and living through those things, what impact did that have on each of you to be able to open up in such a way where you did pull up the rug? Andrea? Well, I think for me, it it allowed me to get way closer to Sean. And I know we kind of joke about like, really, how close can we get? We've been in quarantine now for a year and a half. <laughs> but We're practicing it. physical distancing <laughs> at home. Um, but I mean, truly, when and as a as a parent and as and as a partner, you don't you don't necessarily get into all of these nooks and crannies, and mm -hmm. and it's just really allowed me to become more of a friend to him and find a friend in him for me uh because like my best girlfriends now he knows it all he knows everything he you know there's there's no curtain behind you know the wizard it's it's here's here's what it is here's me all the dirt and all the cracks and all the gross parts and you know i think because of that we've been able to grow a lot closer and a lot more a lot more in our friendship that's that's what it is for me yeah, and I mean, I think from my end, it's just uh, people, Andrea has been obviously really good about understanding and very patient and compassionate towards me. And sometimes as an addict, you have trust issues, you know, and um, and as a, as a survivor of sexual abuse, you have serious trust issues and you start to question like, well, do you really? Like, are you just saying that? But when you talk to someone who's also experienced, uh, you know, the the burden of secrecy in their lives, and the covering under the rug and suffering, you know, uh, because of because of your family relationships, it, it gives me a currency. Like, no, she really she really gets it. She knows what she's she knows what I'm talking about, and that that helps a lot. You know, it's not just because she loves me; it's because she knows what I'm going through. 
And just to pick up on what Sean is saying about your uh, past, Andrea, uh, you write that you played a role in both these men's addictions, uh, meaning your father and Sean. Um, what can you expand on that sentence? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I didn't. I would never have described my um, relationship with either one of them like that until I wrote this book. Um, but I was one hundred percent an enabler. Um, I think it probably started when I was really little, just wanting to make my dad happy. I think, I don't know if all little girls have that desire to to please their parent or, or children have that desire to please their parent, but I just wanted to, you know, make everything fine. I saw my mom doing it, just placate, placate, make everything fine. And then when I got older, I could drink with him um, and excuse his behavior because it, as I write in the book, if he wasn't fine, then I probably wasn't either in terms of how much we were drinking. And that really just trained me on what I could and should accept from a partner. Um, and to get out of that headspace, I, I had to have been forced out of that headspace. And, and the night that I gave Sean the ultimatum, that that is what forced me out of that headspace of what I what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, but certainly living with my dad who had a drinking problem has, well, I actually don't think he has it anymore, but who had a drinking problem, uh, trained me in a way to be complicit and an enabler in Sean's drinking. Well, once Sean, you, what... you always have a drinking problem, I think, once you have one. <laughs> they, yeah. don't, they don't tend to wear That's out. True. But I mean, uh, we, we were drinking buddies at the beginning. 100%. We met at a bar. Uh, Sean, so, hearing uh, Andrea say that, that she was an enabler, um, what goes through your mind when she does say that? Well, it's great. I just blame everything on Andrea. <laughs> it's her fault. Well, you have it on tape now. <laughs> she, she, she drove me to drink, obviously. Uh, well, no, there's again, a lot of sadness in that statement, right? Yeah, and yeah, sometimes you, well, humor is a great uh, reflex as well. So that helps mm -hmm. sometimes. But yeah, I mean, we um, we were both we were both uh, suffering from opposite sides of, of, a, of a painful fence in some ways. And, uh, oh, well put in, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that I've been an enabler in that way, but I know that I'm, you know, alcoholics or drug addicts are drawn to enablers. And, uh, I think enablers are drawn to addicts. So, you know, it's kind of, a. in some ways we were lucky to find each other, uh, in some negative ways at the beginning, but once we've come to, you know, accept these traits in ourselves. You know, I know I'm an addict and I always will be. And Andrea is a pleasing person or tries to help. But you, when you have that response, that's a responsibility that you kind of have to make sure you do the right things. You know, there's there's the best, the, the, the road to hell is paved with the best intentions is a saying. And uh, we were lucky enough to be able to correct those behaviors, I think, or at least become conscious of them because we're not perfect. Obviously no one is, but you know, we, we We've learned to take a take a breath and a step and, and and examine our actions. And in my case, I try to start with the thought process. You know, I overthink a lot of things, and um, you know, sometimes I catch myself just in time to avoid a mistake, which I think that's an evolution. Yeah. Uh, Sean, for most of your life, you had a painful secret. You didn't tell your mo your mother or your father, um, and you even kept it from Andrea. What was that secret? I was um, sexually assaulted by my priest uh, when I was a teenager, and um, he he poured my first drink, um, and drinking was how I chose to cope with it and keep it a secret. And again, in the book, we talk about how indoctrinated my family was for generations by the church, and people, you know, it was just revealing that secret was just not even an option for me at the time as a teenager i wasn't equipped to even think about it and uh the acceptance of that truth in my community wouldn't would not have been quick or real or it would it would have been it would have just gone nowhere so i kept it a secret and i and i drank and used drugs to cope and it set me on my lifetime path of addiction you know and uh, it wasn't until i sobered up that I started to question why I drank in the first place and had and then did the work and dug and faced it myself. And if I hadn't done that, that was painful. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be sober. This happened when this priest 
took you on a trip to Rome. Um, at the time, the Catholic Church was integral part of your life in Newfoundland. Uh, it defined you and how others saw you. After what the priest did to you, how did you see your place in the world? The world just fell out from under me. You know, it was all, uh, everything I believed in was gone. I mean, I was a, I was a believer too. I was fully indoctrinated into the Catholic faith and I certainly, you know, and, and that starts at the, these were, this, this was a man who was my best friend, who was my parish priest, my confessor. He had the power to forgive my sins, the keys to heaven and hell. And in retrospect now, that's way too much power to give to someone, anyone, ever. And uh, so my, I was completely lost. And I just tried to continue on like this, pretend it didn't happen. And uh, as many survivors do, but you, you just never get better that way. You know, it just, uh, the pain seeks an anesthetic. And in my case, it was drugs and alcohol. And I'm just lucky I'm alive because of that. Because I, you know, I survived 35 years of, of severe alcoholism. And it was only the truth that, uh, and dealing with that truth and accepting what happened to me with all the shame and the guilt and the pain that uh, I was able to recover in a meaningful way. And I've been sober now nine years almost. And, uh, you know, it's still painful, but I'm much stronger and I'm stronger enough now without, without those crutches to, to, to live with that acceptance, that truth. Congratulations on the nine years. It's, um, we're very glad that you're here. Um, reading your book and feeling the torment that you went through because this person had been able to insert themselves into your family's life to the point where your own father gave him a key to the house. Uh, so it, it was an individual that you couldn't even escape from even after the fact. Yeah, no, he was, uh, he was quickly, he was very popular uh, priest, but he, you know, they were, he was, priests were the rock stars in our community. They were, uh, you wanted to be, you wanted to be in their favor. Uh, but he, you know, he charmed everybody in our house and, uh, you know, my dad meant nothing by it. It was just, he became like a, a member of the family. He was, he was given a key because he came and he came so often. And whenever True. it was an open door policy, we are in Newfoundland, our doors were seldom locked to be honest, but yeah, he had full access. It, complete access, complete trust very quickly. Because Andrea, of when, Andrea, when you met Sean, um, you had conversations where something, maybe like the hair on the back of your neck kind of rose up um, and you had an idea that something might have happened to him. But you yourself with Sean, you actually never discussed, uh, you didn't find out from him what happened to him. Sean actually... Um, uh, shared his secret, unburdened his secret at an addiction recovery event. What was it like for you finding out that way? Um, well, I remember that the, uh, the London Reco recovery breakfast, they were live tweeting it and it was his first speech. So I was really interested in, in how it was going to go because we had worked on it. And, um, I, I honestly, Nam, I did not expect him to disclose anything other than talk about his alcoholism and his recovery as it was going. Uh, so when he did, I, I honestly, my reaction, it was so visceral. I was, you know, sobbing and, and happy and scared and terrified and joyous and all these different reactions just to see that he was able to say those words and that he actually said those words. and. You know, it was almost as if I could feel his relief. I couldn't, obviously, because he was still speaking and, and I didn't talk to him until a couple hours after. But um, I couldn't, I couldn't, I can't describe to you, if I felt that amount of relief, I, I was like, if I'm feeling this, he must be feeling 10 times lighter than what I'm feeling. And it was just, it was a really emotional moment for me that he could escape out from under that heavy, heavy weight. And I just felt like, okay, we're starting now. And Sean, um, at this event, you actually had a different speech prepared. Um, what made you decide at the, basically it was the very last second to disclose something that you had held so close to your own heart that your wife didn't even know? Well, I mean, I've learned that uh, it, when you think something is too difficult to do, when you see someone do it, actually do it, 
Um, that's a great, that's, there's no better motivation. And in my case, there's a young man, a friend of mine, Polly O'Byrne, his name is, he's, um, he's back in London now working with, uh, with addictions, lovely fellow. And he was going to speak a few minutes. He was also a survivor of sexual assault. And, uh, I didn't know Polly at the time, but he spoke just in front of me, literally right in front of me. And he got up and he spoke for five minutes and he just told the truth. And he, in that five minutes, he told how he was sexually assaulted and how that led to his addiction. And, you know, he was in recovery for about a year at that point, but he was so honest and so frank and, um, it really moved me. Uh, and the, the, when he, when he, you know, bore his soul like that, he didn't catch fire. He didn't blow up. He survived it right in front of me, mm -hmm. walked down and sat down next to me at a table. And I realized he showed me the, he gave me this gift. He showed me that it can be done. Mm. It's, it's difficult, but it can be done. And honestly, he looked, when he sat down next to me, he looked so much stronger. You know, he looked like he was better off for it. And uh, I was motivated. So I just, I figured if he can do it, I can do it. And that's why when I go to speaking events now and do my musical keynotes at conferences and, even in my concerts, well, I'm always a bearer of my truth because I know it encourages people to stop being too afraid to face their own. If they can see someone do it, they know they can. It's just leading by example in some ways, and that's given me a good sense of purpose. But I owe Polly O'Burn quite a bit for, for opening my heart that day. I think in a way you kind of found a, a different community. You had lost one community and then at that event, you gained another one. Um, you've said that uh, music is your religion. In a few minutes, you said stronger. Um, and I want to show you a clip of this a song of yours, uh, Stronger, and then we'll talk some more. Tony, could you please roll? That I am stronger, better every day. I am stronger, and I've got some things to say. I am pretty good. <laughs> Brighter than the sea, I am stronger. How is yeah, there's a sing-along there. You're supposed to sing that part. <laughs> I was like, my voice, I'm one of those people that thinks they sound good in the shower alone. That's it. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> but, you know, music brought you together. I think when you met her, you played um, Redemption Song on the guitar, um, which is one of my all-time favorite songs. But nice. during, this, uh, during this healing process, um, Sean, how has music helped you to heal? It's, you know, it's... For me, it's the music is the is my religion. If religion is supposed to help you deal with difficult situations, if if religion is when you're wrestling with the reasons for existence, or looking for condolence when in grief and all these painful parts of our lives, the questions we can't answer. For me, that's what music really is, and it's far more effective than the sets of rules and and regulations and prayers and all this kind of stuff because it doesn't exact uh, those kind of regulations systems of belief you know music is unregulated but very effective at dealing with those difficult problems that we will all experience in our lives we will all experience suffering in our lives and i would choose my guitar over any church any day and that's just what I believe now because it helps. It genuinely helps. And even if um, it's a sad song, uh, it always lifts my spirit. The physical act of singing always makes me feel better if I'm feeling depressed or I'm feeling sick. You know, I it just it's it's real medicine. I believe music is real medicine. And uh, and what Bob Marley said: one good thing about music, when it hits when it you, hits, you feel no pain. No pain. Yeah. And it does no harm at the very least, and it does some good. So I, uh, I'm a huge advocate for music is music is medicine, and I'm going to sing a Bob Marley song today, <laughs> for <yes>. sure. Now, <laughs> um, you know this book. It you talk about your own individual experiences, um, and I truly believe it's one of those books that's going to help so many people. But along the way, your stories are not um, independent of other people. So how did you balance writing a book that was honest to your experiences, but one where the revelations maybe hurt other people close to you? 
Andrea? Well, I think <laughs> I think we uh, both treaded pretty gingerly at first. Uh, when I got involved in the book, I told Sean I was going to speak my truth and, and it, you know, all the ugly parts and all the great parts. And I committed to that. And as such, I had to talk to my dad and talk to my sister and talk to the people who are integral in my story and not ask them for permission, but say, this is what I wrote. And this is the truth as it as it happened to me and, and how I remember it. And I was real lucky because they were all really supportive, even my father, um, which I was really concerned about because that in the book was the very first time I had actually ever called him an alcoholic. So I was very concerned with his reaction. And he has to this day been nothing but proud of my ability to uh, to say my truth and to hopefully help people. Yeah, true. When truth comes out, it's not always welcome. <laughs> You know, and then habits, when you're in the, in our family's case, you I mean, the truth was always a fiend, you know, we always, that was to be avoided in many cases, in many different ways in our, in, in my upbringing. And I'm still trying to figure a lot of it out, but it's never, it's usually not a welcome thing. Yeah, it's sure it's true, but let's just, let's, okay, let's, let's move on. Let's not talk about it. And uh, so when you go and when you get into business of doing that work, uh, to manage people's expectations, you know, don't just because you, you do that work and you and you dig deep and you try to help yourself. Many people might re be reluctant to go down that path and they may not be ready. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just got to give people their space and respect them. Everyone, you know, has their own time to do that or not. And it's the, it's a decision. Uh, for me, it was the decision to help myself. And, um, you know, just because even at the in regards to the band, just because I changed my behavior didn't mean that everything else changed. Yeah. I was the one who changed. And I know uh, you, cultures are hard things to, to break, you know, to change. I know, you, I know you said that you wrote this book to help yourself, but I truly believe it is going to have helped so many other people. Um, we thank you for your time and we wish you much continued success. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And that's it for tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. We'll see you next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Bacon's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.